Hi, Panos. Thanks for being with us today. It's, it's a pleasure to have you in one of our Tech Rec interviews. And today I have a topic that I, I really like, um, uh, platform regulation. So thanks thank for you, Ider. <laughs> thank you, Ider, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me for this uh, uh, wonderful event. Uh, I think uh, this is important to, uh, um, to host such events and to uh, spread the word on very important issues, especially the uh, ones on, on platform regulation. So before we jump in, uh, just I will let uh, people know, uh, for those who don't know you, that Panos, Panos Con Constantinidis is Professor of Digital Innovation at Manchester University. And he also uh, submitted a very important paper to our Take Red Chronicle uh, that I encourage you to, to read in, in our platform about uh, platform regulation. In particular, the paper is called Regulating Digital Platforms, Business Models, Technology, Architecture, and Governance Rules. And it's a very interesting point of view where uh, Panos compares the digital platforms with traditional utility networks. So let's just jump in, into the conversation. Um, in your paper, you refer to the traditional utility networks, natural monopolies, as an example of regulation that can be, you know, some people argue that could be used for also digital platforms. What do you think about that? Yeah, um, well, I think, uh, first of all, I think it, it, it it's going to be very useful to um, make distinctions between you know, uh, utility infrastructures and digital platforms in relation to whether the latter can be <laughs> seen as a natural monopoly. What do we mean by natural monopoly, right? And, and, and whether they can be seen as, that, as such. So you know, traditional utility infrastructures like energy, train transportation, uh, water infrastructures, you know, they were once developed and owned and operated by a single company. And very often that was done with the support of the state. Um, and why was that the case? Well, that was the case because these infrastructures had high uh, fixed uh, costs, right? Um, so, you know, running uh, an energy grid required quite extensive uh, infrastructure investments and also the maintenance was very costly, right? Um, and usually these uh, um, were, uh, considered to be barriers of entry for other uh, types of companies, right? So um, these companies were considered to have natural monopolies in the sense that, you know, the governments had no incentive to step in and change the state of the market, right? It was the natural state of the market because, you know, changing that, that would mean, you know, that the government now had to incur additional costs to serve uh, you know, basic utilities to their population, right? Water, energy, transportation, right? These are considered to be basic uh, utilities. Now, um, uh, because of that, you know, there was no incentive to allow other companies to step in and, and provide those utilities. And uh, as I mentioned in the, in the article, in the Tegrec article, um, by the 1990s, um, it became clear that these natural monopolies essentially became a state within a state, <laughs> right? They were, they were setting prices, they were setting the terms of service, and they, in fact, influenced government budgets, right? And at that point in time, we had a lot of um, ex-ante uh, regulation to uh, primarily to deregulate these natural monopolies and allow competition between multiple companies, right? The, the whole idea was to to bring down the prices, provide a fair uh, access to, to, to services for, 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 for the population um, and uh, you know, set a different state of, of the market. And, and because of that, right? Now we're getting into the comparison. Now, be, because of that, uh, some commentators have argued that uh, digital platforms are slowly becoming natural monopolies and therefore they should be regulated um, just like uh, utility infrastructures. And as I discuss in the article, I think that's problematic because there are very distinct characteristics um, of digital platforms that differentiate them from utility infrastructures. And the first one, the first one is around in architecture, right? So if you look at an energy grid or a water infrastructure, they're built on very specific architectures that are very much tied to 
the physical product or the, phys- the you know the service that they provide, right? Whether mm-hmm. that's energy or water, right? So by extension, there are very you know defined product boundaries, right? Uh, an energy grid provides energy. It, it cannot provide something else, right? It, it, it doesn't have that capability. Whereas you know with digital platforms, they are usually built on product agnostic um, architectures, right? What do we mean by that? Well, that means that they're not tied to any product um, uh, category. They can do multiple products at a time. And the example that I give in the uh, in the article is that of Amazon Alexa, right? Which is um, embedded in Amazon uh, in the Amazon Echo device. It can offer voice activated streaming um, from Amazon Music, but also from Spotify, right? It can connect to Netflix. Um, it can download and play Kindle audiobooks, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and it can also do a number of other things. It can connect to smart thermostats. It can <laughs> turn on lightning switches and uh, in, in, in smart home applications, right? It can order an Uber, right? Uh, it can read the news for the day. So, you know, the whole idea is that you have this product agnostic architectures, usually cloud-based. So they're leveraging cloud computing and cloud storage and all that, uh, which allows these digital platforms to constantly generate new business models and therefore you know, uh, attract a number of different customer bases, right? Different, different segments. So if we were to treat uh, Amazon Alexa as a natural monopoly, where would we begin to break up, right? <laughs> that monopoly. Where, where do you start? You don't know where to start. I mean, because it's 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 diffused in uh, across so many different uh, but, sectors. But still, right. now what we see with some of the proposed—it's not even proposed, it's approved regulations, especially the, in in Europe, the Digital Markets Act. Some of the measures or the prohibitions that they are uh, foreseen in that uh, piece of legislation. Uh, resembles quite a lot to um, some of the limitations imposed also in utilities or natural monopolies, self-preferencing, uh, for example, prohibition or to give access to, uh, to third parties in obviously equal conditions, etc. These are very, very similar to natural monopolies. No? That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's true to some extent. Um, and uh, if you don't mind, can I briefly also mention the, the other two key characteristics? Because uh, I only mentioned the please, first please. one, which is the product agnostic architecture. I just, I just wanted to know more. That's why. I just wanted to <laughs> but before I jump into that question, and I, I think it's an excellent question, obviously, you know, there's, there's good to have some pushback and challenge, yeah, challenge yeah. the ideas. But I just want to mention the other two characteristics, which is, you know, value creation, Mm-hmm. and uh, governance. Um, so in comparison to utility infrastructures, right? So how did utility infrastructures, you know, create value? They, they created value primarily from the supply uh, of services or products, right? Mm-hmm. They supplied water, they supplied energy, they supplied telecommunications, right? So they were very much built on supply side economies of scale. Again, that's not true for digital platforms, because platforms depend not just on the suppliers of services, but also on the users, right? You, you can have one without the other, yeah. right? And this is the whole idea behind network effects, cross-site network effects, value co-creation that has been extensively discussed in the literature. Mm-hmm. And why now, why is that important? And again, it comes back to the point of natural monopolies, right? Now we keep talking about the dominance of big tech companies, right? How you know these companies like Facebook, they're they're so dominant that nothing can break them. Well, no, right? <laughs> I mean, in the last couple of weeks, and in fact, in the last few years, uh, we've seen the demise of Facebook, right? Um, and 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 we've seen also the emergence of completely new social media platforms, right? So TikTok is a great example, right? TikTok has come to challenge Facebook, right? At the very core. And it's not just attracting the newer, the younger generation of users, 
Um, but it's also attracting businesses. I mean, it, it's unbelievable. They have uh, more than 500 million active users, and they now have what they call TikTok for business, where they're trying to engage their top creators, their top influencers, and match them with businesses for uh, uh, content around marketing and advertising. So that goes to say, again, multiple value, multiple business models, and the, the value comes from both the demand and the supply side. So you don't have a natural monopoly where uh, you know, a supplier can just pretty much dominate the market. Mm -hmm. And then, then the final point, and, and then I'm, I, I can move on to the next question that you asked, is that of um, uh, governance, right? Exactly because now you have both production and consumption of services and the dynamic interaction between the two, there are different types of, of governance required. And I'm sure you've, you've heard in, in previous podcasts that you've done uh, this, this idea of application programming interfaces, right? The API, right? In the banking sector, the open API initiative has completely changed the industry, right? And, and, and those are the type of technical governance mechanisms that platforms use to um, you know, govern interactions on the platform. But they also have a, a number of behavioral governance rules, such as, such as curating content, you know, um, uh, di di dividing uh, uh, and, and segmenting, I should say, segmenting users. Um, well, dividing it is in fact <laughs> something that Facebook did and polarized uh, debates, which is something that helped mm -hmm. their advertising. I didn't want to say divide, yeah, but that's, that's for another, another topic. That, that's yeah. topic for another another discussion, another video. Maybe another, another discussion. <laughs> yeah, but it is there, right? It, and it's part of the governance. Sometimes it helps. Sometimes it divides. Sometimes it polarizes, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, and why is this important? It's important because this kind of governance rules depend on cross-site network effects and the demand uh, uh, side uh, uh, elasticities that is not true for utility infrastructures, right? Because utility infrastructures always depended, everything came from the supplier, right? There's no such thing as demand side elasticities or cross side network effects, right? It was all about production. Okay. So that was the, the, those, those were the three points that I wanted to make, but I'm, I'm happy to jump into the next question. Do you wanna, do you wanna answer the, the, ask the question again, maybe? Well, uh, I, was, uh, I was referring to the uh, Digital Markets Act, but also similar, we we uh, we can read also similar approaches in the U.S. with the the, the bills that they're trying to pass there, where the uh, the big tech companies now they will have to open up a little bit sometimes their their networks to provide access in fair terms to avoid self preferencing, which is pretty much the same. Uh, theory of harm or different theory of harm that we had with the telcos when the telcos were actually favoring their own um, yeah. uh, company downstream. So we see very similar um, remedies. So then the question was about, are we talking about a natural monopoly? But now I'm going to even challenge you a little bit more. If it's not a natural monopoly, is this an essential facility? Which is slightly different. It's not the same, but is now Google, Facebook essential facilities and we all need access to them? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's those. Those are very good questions. So let me let me first uh, answer the point about self-preferencing, right? So um, I think um, in the past, um, this idea of self-preferencing was called, if I'm not mistaken, was called uh, discrimination. I'm not a I'm not a legal expert, but I've read a little bit on this. And uh, so, you know, these natural uh, monopolies, right? So the, the, the firms that own the infrastructures um, had obligations in relation to other suppliers in the market. So, you know, whether those suppliers needed the asset, we, we've seen that with telecom players, right? Mm -hmm. uh, especially just before those telecom infrastructures were dere deregulated, we had a number of smaller suppliers that depended on the physical assets of the, uh, the natural monopolies, right? And, um, you know, very often they would refuse access to those assets. They would uh, um, implement margin squeezes. They would discriminate mm -hmm. who to supply to, right? And that's why uh, this was called discrimination. And these were 
I, I think by now everyone recognized these as uh, clear cases of abuse uh, of market dominance, right? Now, in the case of digital platforms, they call this self-preference. And it happens in similar ways, but I would also say that there is a difference, right? So, so uh, I'll just give an example. So Apple um, pre-installs native apps on all iOS devices, right? Mm -hmm. And they, they make those apps the default option for users. So if, you, if you're trying to um, search, uh, or, or rather there's a request to open up a browser, the default option is Safari, right? There's a, if there's a request to open a music file, the default option is Apple Music and so on, right? Ebook for Apple Books and, and so on. So now at the surface, <laughs> this looks like discrimination, right? But um, there, in this case, we're talking about something different because um, Apple is not um, disallowing the choice of users. And this was actually also one of the uh, cases where Google was fined by, by, by EU um, in 2018, right? That it made Google search the default option. And that was a, a different case. Whereas here with, with Apple, I think there's, diff there's a difference in the sense that users can choose their default application. So they can change the default mm -hmm. from Apple Books to something else. And I would argue that Apple has all the right to do that because as you know, Apple users, you know, Apple users like Apple because everything is integrated. Everything is, simple, is seamless, right? They like the user experience. They want everything packed uh, in one product, right? So Apple has all the right to do that for its Apple users, right? To provide a better experience. Um, now, and I, and I keep coming back to this idea of choice, right? The user has choice uh, in this case, and there's evidence for this, right? Apple Music doesn't have the dominance in the market. Apple Music only has 15% of the market. Spotify is still the dominant player. Um, so in this case, I would say, even though they're self-preferencing, I don't think this is abuse. Where you do have abuse <laughs> is something else that also from Apple, you know, Apple's app tracking transparency policy, okay. where it's, it's allowing its users to opt out mm -hmm. from having their data tracked by an app, but <laughs> they're only doing that for third-party apps. They're not doing that <laughs> for, their own, for their own apps, right? Now, now that's abuse. That's abuse, right? Because you're cutting the choice. You're, you're removing the user choice. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is self-preferencing with abuse that, that is unlawful. So what I'm trying to say is that um, in the case, exactly for all the reasons that I've discussed earlier, right? Mm -hmm. That you have multiple business models running. You have these uh, architectures that are product agnostic and they can shift at any given time to serve a different uh, user segment uh, with different services, with different products. I think we need to be careful what we call self-preferencing and what we call the right of a platform to provide a better user experience. Because remember, you know, by providing a better user experience, if those users stay with the platform, that's bound to attract more providers, therefore more business. So both sides gain. But when you kill the choice, when you remove that choice, that's abuse, right? And that has to be regulated. So I think there needs to be both ex ante regulation, a, a, you know, an overarching framework that talks about these things, but then you need to have ex post uh, regulation where you go in and you regulate individual cases uh, on the basis of, uh, you know, whether those cases are, are, are un unlawful, as I said. So um, then I, you basically answered the last question I wanted to ask you, but still I'm going to ask you because uh, <laughs> it's not only it's not only in, in your previous answer. But um, so what's your view about the regulation that is coming uh, or is already here, the, the Digital Markets Act and similar uh, pieces of legislation that will come in the UK or in the US? Are they necessary? Are they good as they are drafted? Yeah, so um, I think... 
um, uh, definitely the 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 DMA, the the Digital Markets Act, um, is a step in the right direction, and I I, I think there's a lot of experts. Uh, both business, technology, economists, and, and legal experts that have acknowledged that. Um, but at the same time, I think exactly for the points that are raised in the article, um, I think we need to be more careful and not to treat the, um, um, you know, this idea of uh, defining a gatekeeper on the, base, uh, on the basis of size and revenue uh, as the uh, the, 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 you know, the all end uh, point for regulating uh, platforms. Um, because again, um, I think we need to understand the individual business models, the technology architectures and the governance rules that each um, uh, platform uh, uses before we can uh, define uh, the regulation. And I'll give you an example, right? So. One of the examples that I use in the article um, is that of Google Android. And, and Google Android started as an open source project, which I thought was a fantastic uh, business strategy uh, from Google because, you know, new entrant in the market. How do I get all the original equipment manufacturers together, right? I, I provide uh, a competition. I, I let all the open source software developers out there in the world develop the best operating system because you know uh, there's open innovation usually results in, in you know great products right that's that's a fact that that has been recorded in history um, so I, I I allow the open source uh, software to take uh, uh, place I build relationships with the OEMs right? And then I come in and take over. And, and what they did in 2012, and there's evidence to show that this was a deliberate strategy, right? They came in and they implemented a set of um, APIs, which they call Google Play, uh, a proprietary set of APIs that essentially bundled uh, all their different products together, right? And they necessitated all the OEMs that participated on Android to have those installed. So you couldn't have Google Maps, mm -hmm. Gmail, Google Search, YouTube, right? You, you had to have all of them together implement. You couldn't have one and not the other, right? Why did they, why did they do that? Because they realized that essentially they added a middle layer in the, in the architecture of, of the operating system where they could just uh, data aggregate, right? They could aggregate data from all the apps, right? They could get information and knowledge, intelligence about what all the apps, what all the third parties were doing, run their advertising, because let's not forget, I mean, you know, Google built Google search, right? And Google search is the star product and mm -hmm. Google search runs on advert, you know, they, they make money from advertising, right? So, this move was a great move by Google to, um, to run their business model. Now, from someone that coming from the outside, they, you know, they may think that this is just open source. It's not like Apple. Apple is all about control. Google is all open source. But yet, in fact, there's a lot of control points yeah. <laughs> in the architecture, right? And uh, they are bundling products together. They are tying things together very much like, you know, the, the discrimination practices that we talked about uh, earlier. And, uh, and I think that is an example of how companies um, have a very sophisticated architecture because it's almost like a plug and play, right? I, I mean, you have different modules, you plug them in. In this case, you have interfaces. You don't even have applications. These are interfaces that interconnect with a number of different apps, right? And those interfaces are doing all the work. Um, so, I, I, and of course, there's business models that are built on top of those. So I think in that case, that's definitely abuse. I mean, you're taking advantage uh, of a number uh, of, of different third parties across verticals, right? We're not talking about a single industry here. We're talking about multiple verticals at the same time. Because, and, and again, one of the things that I think we don't get right yet in the regulation 
um, is this idea of digital data, right? Digital data is at the core of digital platform models because it is everything is based on data, right? If you have the data, you can build new services, you can build the market, you can you can attract users, you can run out, you know, you can do so many different things. It, it's it's power uh, to building services and products, and Google has that with, of course, the Google search uh, product, uh, that is the star product that I said, they have so much information uh, and they're classifying and categorizing everything uh, that allows them then to build more customized individual specialized services into different verticals and compete with those of the, uh, of the third parties. And um, I think what we, what we need to understand is that um, exactly because of the power of digital data to fit in different business models, we need to absolutely understand the different business models. And there are multiple, sometimes there are multiple business models sitting on, on, on one platform, right? And we need to regulate those individually with ex post uh, regulation, uh, as opposed to coming in with a, a grand framework that covers assumingly tries to cover everything, uh, but misses the, uh, you know, the very specialized uh, nuances uh, uh, that uh, are there on, on these digital uh, platforms. And I'm not using legal terms here. I'm, yeah, no. <laughs> uh, so I, I, hope, I hope people are, are, are fine with my language, but I, I hope that my message is clear that uh, yeah, it anyway, be very complex. Anyway, uh, I think regulators are, are not planning to stop using enforcement actions either. So even if they have the new regulation, and it will obviously limit some practices, um, I'm pretty sure they're going to still look at these companies at their business models. And if something is not working in their view, well, uh, they will act accordingly. So I I'm yeah. sure that will be, will be okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Panos, uh, has been a pleasure to, to talk to you today. It was, it was very interesting. Um, but unfortunately, we can't continue much, much longer. Uh, I could, but, <laughs> but for today, uh, we, we are just getting at the end of our conversation. And I wanted just to thank you again for, for being with us today. Thank you so much, uh, Aitor. This, uh, it has been a pleasure as well. And uh, looking forward to, uh, to hearing more from you and uh, all the work that you do at uh, payments.com. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>